Good afternoon, one and all. On behalf of the Department of Dance, Saturday and Idol School of Arts and Communication, I extend a warm welcome to you all for this Adaraja Ramakrishna Memorial Lecture. This lecture has been instituted in the year of 2008 when the Sanatraja Ramakrishna was alive. In fact, the Sanatraja Ramakrishna was the first appointed professor of this department of dance at Sarajini Naidu School. And he steered all of us through the ups and downs and established the department at par with other departments of the country. In fact, the first PhD program in the southern India has been started in our university. And in a short span of seven years, he has produced seven PhDs from this department. Besides this, he has been gracious to donate all his awards, including his Padma Shri, the Sangeet Natak Academy and Award, and numerous other awards that he has brought in his lifetime to the University of Heidelberg. In fact, at that point of time, the Executive Council of this university has taken a decision that we have to effectively celebrate him for the contribution that he has not only made to the university but to the academics across the country and also to the dance forms, various dance forms, cutting across four classical and also the other forms of dance, the traditional theatre forms of the Telugu country. Today, I am thankful to our Vice Chancellor, Dr. B.J. Rao, for having approved this under the uh, Distinguished Lecture Series and also the Dean of the School for supporting this particular lecture financially. We could first have a short, short documentary made by the students of SN School Communication Department on the Nataraja Ramakrishna. It's a very short one. After which we would have our speaker and Vice Chancellor and the Dean come on to the stage. Nataraja Ramakrishna and Avakti Prapuncha Mulukutti Lokani Kalaseva Cheshar and Tepi Lokam Talsava Lagani Nenu, 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 Nadi, Nenu, 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 A legendary dancer, a revered guru, a zealous scholar, founding father of the Department of Dance in the University of Hyderabad, Dr. Nataraja Ramakrishna is a man of many enduring qualities. An exponent of many dance forms, he had also resurrected ancient art forms like Perani Sivatandavam and a 2000 year old dance tradition called Andhra Natyam. <laughs> He had dedicated his entire life selflessly to bring these art forms onto the floor. He had mastered the technique of Satrika Abhinayam and believed that it carries the ultimate essence of dance. కళతరే <laughs> Ramai pilih je kan, mana proses itu je. Anjala juga terserah kan. Mana sebelah kat ada bukti itu bukti tu. Anjala baik pada orang. Baik pada. Pilih je. Kalau ni lah cerita kat eh, abinya kan aje itu ramu. Aisyu si, itu ke? Asing lelai ya, kan? Mudah lelai mana? 
మీ ముద్రాభయ ఎండ అవుతుంది మీ ముద్ర అధినయం ఎక్కడ ఎండ అవుతుందో అక్కడ మా సాక్ష్య గారిని ఆకర్షించింది and enthrall the audiences wherever he performed idi kurtalam swami ji nenu vaizhav vadiga sarichu tiru swami ji vadad bhagavad gita to nadame nangu sharme nanu kudam uttarni agane jodu ayana kutte jodu ayana sishulanta vachi a swami ji ki స్వామీజీ నాకు కొంచెం ఆడుకోవాలి స్వామీజీ హృదయంతో బుద్ధి పుట్టి అభినయం అంటే ఏం కాదు చేసేవాడు చూసేవాడు యొక్క హృదయంతో ఆడుకోవాలి అది అభినయం he had also spearheaded the renovation of the tombs of taramadi and baradari okapudu rajulu maharajulu kalakaralu andaru kuda vachi ikkada aa nrutya vinodalani sangeetanni aashadinchara ee nadu emi ledhi ani cheppi nenu aavedana karigindi dani gurinchi nenu ayi samasthalu sikshesanu prabhutvanni koranu prabhutvanu angikarincharu it is a privilege that he had chosen to give some of his rare awards conferred to him to our university to be kept and displayed in its portals words for short in describing his contribution to university of hyderabad he had trained many dancers guided many scholars authored many books and above all inspired all of us Dr. Nataraja Ramakrishna, an epitome of knowledge, dedication and humility. Sadiviti Sakala Shastaramu, Andali Saramu Lella Grahinchiti, Anta Jnana Nedramu Vipichuda, Tilisi Kuntinina Kedi Kiri. Today, that is 21st March, he completes the 99th year and steps into the centenary year of his. So, we would love to celebrate the entire year and there are several students of him who are planning several events throughout this year. I'm so happy. that the university of hyderabad is able to start this entire celebrations through this lecture of uh, dr nataraj ramakrishna which uh, shrimati chitra vishveshwaran has graciously agreed to deliver thank you very much ma'am now i request the vice chancellor professor vijay rao garu and the dean of the school shivasaki belavadi to accompany chitra vishveshwaran garu on the stage and place the stage I request our Vice Chancellor to kindly take over and then conduct the meeting.
this is a very uh, special day for all of us to be welcoming the uh, uh, Chitra Vishweshwarindi uh, and then to pay homage to uh, our beloved Nataraj Ramakrishna ji, wherever he is, we pay homage today. I do not know when you visited University of Hyderabad last, but this is our first gathering post-COVID. So it's a special opening today. We were, we were really caught in dark ages for two years. So today you bring us light. So without going into too many other details, I really want to welcome all of you for this very, very important day where we are all blessed. Uh, I would uh, uh, request uh, Madam Garu to do the honors of lighting the lamp and then we start the proceedings. We will introduce the speaker. Good afternoon, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor B. J. Rao, Dean. SN School of Arts and Communication, Professor Vasuki Bellavadi, dear colleagues, students, and friends, I take the privilege of introducing the distinguished guest and speaker of this afternoon, Padmashri Chitra Vishweshwaran. The name Chitra Vishweshwaran is an illustration of music in motion. She is an embodiment of the ethos of Indian dance. Here is a glimpse into her journey. Chitra Vishweshwaran, a legend in the field of Indian dance, is a scholar, thinker, and seeker. Her deep rooted training in dance and music, combined with an inner thirst for knowledge and an eclectic background covering Carnatic music, Western ballet, Manipuri, Kathak, Rabindra Nrutya, Rabindra Sangeet and Theatre launched Chitra on the dance scenario as a prima donna. This enabled her to go beyond the grammar and technique of Bharatanatyam and evoke in the viewer 
a unique aesthetic and spiritual experience. Known as an extraordinary choreographer, Chitra Vishveshwaran, in collaboration with musician composer husband R. Vishveshwaran, has created a voluminous body of work covering several margams, thematic solo, group, and dance theatre productions. Her works reflect a synergy of tradition, innovation, and contemporaneity. Through her Chidambaram Academy of Performing Arts, established in 1974, she introduced a new approach and holistic vision to dance training. The Academy, over years, produced several, several performers and scholars of eminence. Chitra Vishveshwaran has presented her works at several prestigious venues and festivals, nationally and internationally. These include Festival of United Nations, Festival of UNESCO, Festivals of India at USA, USSR, Spain, and the 50th year of India as a Republic in Germany, BBC International Telecast for India's 50th year of independence, the French Opera Festival. A sought-after speaker, she has contributed papers, lectures, and lecture demonstrations at prestigious cultural forums and universities across the globe. She has been honored with several national and international awards, including Padma Shri, Sangeet Nath Academy Puraskar, Kalai Mamani of the Tamil Nadu State Award, Nritya Churamani by Sri Krishna Gana Sabha, Arshakala Bhushanam by Pooja Sri Swami Dayananda Saraswati, Shreshta Kala Pracharak by Ganesh Natyalaya New Delhi, Yami Award by Music Today, Nritya Vilas by Sursingar Sansad Mumbai, for the sake of honor, Rotary Award, Nritya Ratnakara by Cleveland Aradhana Committee, Honorary Citizenship of the City of Bourg, France, and Japan Foundation Award for Excellence, to name a few. Chitraji, we welcome you to deliver the Nataraja Ramakrishna Memorial Award 2022. Thank you. Dakshina Mukti Samarambham Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmat Acharya Pavyantam Vande Guru Paramparam Om Damo Bhagavate Krishna. As I stand here today, I feel deeply humbled. It is such a privilege to be part of the distinguished lecture series under the aegis of the University of Hyderabad, under the Essen School of Arts and Communication, at an event which is the stepping in of the, into the 99th year of the illustrious Dr. Nataraja Ramakrishna. My namaskarams to the respected Vice Chancellor. My namaskarams to the respected Dean. And, and greetings to all my colleagues from the fraternity who are here today, besides those who are very much part of Essen School of Arts and Communication, and thank you, students who are gathered in numbers, to be here to sh when I share my journey, my voyage of discovery, something I hope that inspires every one of you, even as the journey of great artists like Dr. Nataraja Ramakrishna inspired our generation. It is not just a humbling experience, but it is also a great honor. It is a great privilege to be here. And I do feel that this is an ideal platform for me to share my approach. Born of research over years and share with you how I actually worked 
towards dance becoming a very effective tool of communication in today's scenario. I am known by and large today as a Bharatanatyam dancer, teacher, choreographer, whatever, but sum it up in the word practitioner and a devotee of the art of Bharatanatyam. I am known to have a very individualistic approach which is holistic and interdisciplinary. And this is born of the experience received in different genres as early as the 1960s when I was a youngster at Kolkata. So when I came to Madras, then Madras, now Chennai, under the Central Government Scholarship Scheme, I had already been under many external influences. And from this was born a certain attitude to my way of thinking, a certain, and these influences had molded my way of thinking, my attitude towards dance, and other allied forms. Usually, you find most practitioners of every dance form attaining a certain degree of proficiency before moving out, before searching, before seeking outside their comfort zone. But with this background that I came from, it was very different because I came from the outside to the inside and I was searching within. In Kolkata, I was greatly privileged. And why was I privileged? I did not learn any compromised style of Bharatanatyam, which I learned from one of the latest Devadasis of the Tiruvade Vardur Samasthanam who was settled there, Srimati T. A. Raja Lakshmi. She was a strict traditionalist, a no compromise, no nonsense person. After learning with her for 10 years, and during that period, I had no influence of other Bani's of Bharatanatyam on my dance, because things were so isolated at that point of time. When I was with her, and even earlier, I not only learned Bharatanatyam, but I learned Manipuri, Kathak, Robindro Nritya, Robindro Shungi, in addition to Carnatic music. I participated in theatre, which is highly evolved in Kolkata, and trained in lighting during that period, the 1960s, under the great Papur Shen. With this eclectic background, when I shifted to Madras under the Central Scholarship Scheme, to study from none other than the great visionary, Mavu Ramya Pillai, I had much to experience further. He was as much a radical as Raja Lakshmi teacher was a traditionalist. They were literally two ends of the, of the spectrum. But fired by my multi-layered background and being brought up by parents who always pushed me to think of a fifth solution when there were only four known ones, those four years of learning under the great Varvurar as we know, know, as he was known, for four years was an absolutely mind-opening experience. Empowered with this background, I set out on a personal voyage of research and artistic discovery that led to the creation of an individualistic style 
at a body of work entirely mine. Of course, along the way, I had already started enriching myself with the study of our Lakshana Granthas. Lakshana Granthas which have come down to us through the centuries. Their commentaries and interpretation and, in, and more recent publications by knowledgeable scholars of our times. However, along the way, even as I passionately went through the Granthas under my Sanskrit guide, or ones in local languages like, uh, uh, like the Kutanol, again specialists in that language, I realized that the Lakshana Granthas did not epitomize a be all and end all of anything. Because when you think of it, what came first? Did the Lakshya come first or the Lakshana Grantha come first? The Lakshana Grantha was a documentation of the Lakshya at that point of time in historically and socially and culturally. And I also realized that as time progressed, each Lakshana Grantha became more became more uh, became uh, more specific in its genre. It did not bear as the Natya Shastra encompassed all subjects. Each one, not Lakshana Grantha, became a tome of speciality, much as we have speciality studies of various subjects nowadays. Having said that, even though my set search widened my horizon considerably, my mind kept harking back to the holistic approach of, may I say, our Adi Grantha, the Natya Shastra. Because the Natya Shastra documents our art forms as they existed at that point of time. And the art forms were shown as being knitted closely. And there, or any art form was part of a composite whole. And it also appeared to reflect Bharatvasha spirit, which reflects symbi symbiosis and inclusiveness. And this close relationship between all the art forms is what made me more and more convinced that however much one specialized in one genre, it was extremely essential to seek and receive continued inspiration from allied art forms and alternate sources of inspiration. <laughs> I'm sure you will relate to this when I say, ever since I can remember, I have been hearing and reading about statements like, dance is music of the body, dance is a means of expression, dance is a language unto itself, dance is elevating, dance awakens one spirituality at all. But how do these become experiences? These were the questions that haunted me. And above all, I felt that didn't dance have all the makings of becoming a perfect tool of communication at any level, be it physical, be it emotional, be it intellectual, or be it spiritual. These, this made me turn to the allied art forms seeking inspiration in a deeper manner than which I had done earlier. When I speak of the art forms, there are so many other art forms today which can still continue to inspire us, but I have to confine myself to some, uh, some part of the study because the allied art forms would include music, literature, which includes poetry, sculpture, painting, theater, 
we can move on adding on. What about lighting? What about the technological uh, uh, trusts that are there, artistic trusts that are there? All these could leave you that, but I am sharing my journey. Even subjects which are related, such as philosophy, human psychology, cultural, historical, and social contexts, to, to just mention a few, would contribute considerably for enhancing dance when you study it and work upon it as a tool of communication. There is no point studying dance and any of these allied dance forms, putting them into individual boxes and talk about dance and music, dance and painting, dance and sculpture, dance and music. No, just studying them in different compartments would not do anything towards a symbiosis. And if they had to come together and create a spa, they would have to be studied with the view of interrelationship in mind, a real interrelationship which should be nourishing and which should enhance what is already a given to us. When I say this, I feel why I cannot compartmentalize it and put them into separate boxes is when you think of dance and music, can you forget literature and poetry? When you talk of dance and line and form, how can you ignore painting and sculpture? And while discussing dance and body language and characterization, how can I one overlook theatre? Each one nourishes the other. However, to the lay person, The symbiotic relationship between dance and music would appear to be strongest. A natural extension of this would be towards literature, which includes sahitya and poetry. Now, uh, by practice, if we think about music for dance, and I come from the point of view of Bharatanatyam, and it would, it would largely apply to all styles. We work with music which is particularly and specially composed for the Bharatanatyam marga. Then we have in the second part category music that was not written for the dance but music which has been adopted by dancers from the concert platform. And then we come to music from temple ritual, even as the music of Perani, from an old form. And then we have music in the fourth category, being the music used to put to put to melody extracts from literary and poetic texts which were never written by the poet with dance in mind. And finally, music from the Bhakti Sampradaya which has been adopted into dance and enriches this discipline in itself. Beyond this, explorations into different languages, different styles of music has been going on. And this has led to an extension of repertoire. And this extension of repertoire has already been a path that has been illuminated by our all-time greats. Inspired deeply by these all-time greats, I also followed their path which resulted in my entire body of work. But that, however, is outside the purview of today's paper.
as I lived to dance. I would like to say I lived to dance, it breathed dance. I sought to find a deeper relationship between the dance and music, which be went beyond the music composition, the lyric, the direct meaning, the layered meaning. I wanted to find something deeper because I was sure that there was something deeper. Here I would like to share with you certain incidents and certain styles which also made me think in a different way. Merce Cunningham, the modernist, believed that dance could exist without music. Whereas Balanchine, who took ballet to the USA, believed that dance and music were irrevocably wedded to one another. Balanchine's approach had greater better appeal to me. For after all, are we not a people who believes that Saraswati plays upon the Veena and the Veena is symbolic of our own bodies? I wondered then, how could I bring the jaru of the Veena into my body movement? How could I bring the gamaka and the briga of the melody line into my dance? And into my dance could only be through my body. How could I work towards making this a successful experiment? It's easiest to be an experiment once it's successful. So one has to work towards that. So this started me thinking, is it enough for a dancer to know good music? You have to be gifted to be able to actually sing or play, play an instrument, but still to be well knowledge and to be know deeply of music. Is it enough to know the theory of music? Is it enough to know the pun system and the melagarta system? Is it enough just to be a very good practicing musician for a dancer? But I felt what was necessary was all this is of course added, but added to this the most, most important thing required for a dancer where music is concerned, is to develop extreme sensitivity to music at the point of performance. You have to forget you're a musician and you have to re react to the music and you have to become a rasika of your pakkavadyam at the point of time of performance. And I used to encourage my musicians to be absolutely spontaneous. I didn't want them to be shattered. After all, we have gone into so many Sanjari Babas nowadays in our disciplines. If dance can evolve like that, why can't we use music which has already evolved? And where besides the Gamakas and Sangadis and Brigas we have, Nerevel in music, why can't we use that? And if the dancer's body and mind, and I would say the entire being, is trained to react to that music, at that point of time, enjoying the pakkavadyam, that is, has to be a pakkavadyam, <laughs> enjoying it, 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 it becomes an overall, it becomes an indescribable experience to the dancer and to the onlooker because the music gives us wings to fly and reacting to that with our entire being, we can soar and the sky is the limit. I trained my musician, my dancers, to react to music the way I always did. But believe me, when you have a dancer who is a very good musician also, it is so difficult to make that dancer stop singing to himself or herself while dancing and getting carried away by one's own interpretation and listen to the music at that point of time. 
It is an onerous task trying to make a good dancer who is a good musician do this and just become a rasika at that point of time. And believe me, when we become rasikas, the audience automatically become rasikas. To me, actually, it doesn't matter. If a dancer doesn't know the difference between a Bhairavi and a Husseini, if the dancer doesn't know the difference between a Chandrakons and a Malkons, it's only one Nishadam. Of course, if they know it, that's plus. But it is more important to me for the dancer to be sensitive at that point of time to the mood of the mel melody and the lyric. For in my approach to dance, there is an interrelated nourishing bond between dance, music, and literature. For those of my friends who are, who are here, who have seen my performances with my husband, would agree that was an experience in itself. And it was great having a husband, musician husband, who had knowledge of of many genres of music. He was never averse to thinking out of the box. And that made every discovery and every step forward so much more to cherish. Once we were working on a, a, on a production based on the lyrics of Purandaradasa. Taking Purandara Rasa's lyrics, Purandara Krishnamritam, as this uh, production was titled, dealt with the Bhakta's relationship to Krishna through Vatsalya, to Krishna through Sringara, and to Krishna through Bhakti. So we, we, we began by taking up a beautiful lullaby of now what normally happens is we all are conditioned. Every one of us is conditioned. And immediately we think, okay, lullaby, nilambari, nishrachapu, oranadi. Then we said, let us do something different. Let us try. Maximum what? We will fail. Doesn't matter. Let us learn to fall and pick up ourselves and walk, run, and fly again. So uh, we decided on the Raga, which I always associate with Kuchipudi, which is so beautifully brought out Mohanam. And we thought of the Tala Kandachapu. What do we normally do? Kandachapu means it's Ravana coming in. Tam takita, deem takita, tom takita, nam takita. Or it's a negative character, something evil. It's, it's, it not, or something of vira. But not something with as gentle as a lullaby. Usually not. So we said, let us take the combination of Mo Mohanam and Kandachapu. And as we worked and continue to work, we went through several phases of this experiment and finally came to the end product, which was so well appreciated and received so well by my colleagues and my seniors too. It was then that I, that I realized it was as much the kala or the speed in which the tempo in which the piece is taken that determines the mood of a piece. So it was a relaxed Gandhachabu with a very soothing Mohanam which put Krishna to sleep in Purandar Krishna. This pushing of the envelope was always part of my work. And music, my husband and I would thus experiment, we would push, we would see. And we would finally experience the joy of taking the next step forward. On the side, creating this production was also a great learning process for me. 
from the point of view of content. To discover how many Shringara Padas Purandara Dasa had proposed. Till that point in time, I, I think it was 1991, 1991. I had always been, uh, I had been already awakened to the Shringara Padas of Annamacharya through Dr. Arudra Garu. But I was not aware till I studied this with Dr. S.K. Ramachandra Rao that there were so many Shringarapadas of Purandara Dasa. So, you know, our search and research brings in so much knowledge and also humbles you that what you know is a very little part of what there is more to know about. However, through all these myriad explorations, I realized that dance cannot exist in vacuum. The dance and the dancer cannot evolve when in isolation. There has to be nourishment. There has to be enrichment. There has to be sakha. So I concluded that if my dance had to become an exemplary tool of communication, my approach had to be holistic and inclusive. But after this brief discussion of the symbiotic relationship between dance, music, and literature, I would like to go dwell on another thrust, an important thrust in my approach of using the entire body as a tool of communication. We all are equipped with knowledge, and what is this knowledge which has been handed down to us? Knowledge of Badangas, Bhagas, Pratyangas, Gatis, Jaris, um, Karanas, Angaharas, um, Sanakas, Nrittahastas, Grivas, Bhatas, so on and so forth. The list is absolutely humongous. It's huge. And it can never stop. It never will stop. You could then ask me, if there is so much already handed down to us, what is the need to look further into Angika Abhinaya? What is the need to look further into expression through the human body? I have earlier in this paper talked about cultural, sociological, historical, geographical context. Earlier on, and I had also spoken about being relevant to the present day scenario. In earlier times, in the past, history tells us, dance was done in the temples and the smaller areas of the back, uh, of the port. See, you see in olden Sadir, the dance movement is up and down, up and down, up and down. It's a corridor-like movement. That was because it was the space of the Garbhagirha and the temple in front of the deity that had to be used by the Devadasi. However, after the promulgation of the Devadasi Act, dance has made the public platform its its habitat. Over the past several decades, we are dancing, dancers are dancing on all sorts of different types of stages. It could be a proscenium stage, a black box stage, an Elizabethan stage, an open air stage, a semicircular stage. And the audiences are much larger also. The performance play space had changed. And dance, to my way of thinking, could, could, should and could well adapt, it, adapt itself to the changed scenario. For the earlier uh, performance stage that dance is used, the existing grammar of pertaining to moha, mukha and hasta combination would be adequate if not more than adequate. So my question was, 
since I was taking it to different spaces and different sizes of audience, could I not enrich the existing language of dance by taking inputs from other allied art forms, not just cut, copying, and pasting them, but through the process of, symbi of osmosis, make it my very own, and then make it relevant to the new scenario. And so my, con my search continued. I have always found theater a great source of inspiration. Maybe that's my Kolkata background, always going on weekends to watch the Bobo Bobo Rupi in action. I have always enjoyed theater, both as a participant and as a viewer. The concept of presence in theater I realized could well be adapted for dance. I slowly introduced this into my solo work. So when I came and stood on stage, by my very stance, the audience could relate better to which naika I would be presenting. After all, the body stance and the body language of a Girohot Khandita is so different from the body language of an Abhicharika. Why? There is a difference between the body language of a Ratri Abhicharika and a Divasa Abhicharika. I extend this handling of the body slowly to other characters in Solo itself. A small turn of the shoulder, a slight tilt of the head, the way the body was held showed me to communicate effectively to the audience and without falling prey to the overly dramatic and at the same time retaining subtlety of facial expression. Sai Priya here will share a clipping from uh, uh, an extract from my solo panchali, where you will see how the body, without moving from one point to other, taking circles to show character changes, can communicate so many shades of a character and so many different characters. Panchali the solo. <coughs>
Bharatiya's Panchali, once Shakuni starts feeling, he never puts down the dice. So it's important to go into the deeper layers of literature because the same scene is not, for instance, presented the same way by Valmiki and Kambani. So it is important that we search and seek 
all those pearls. And it was such a voyage of learning. Applying these shades of learning and levels of learning to the work that I did. I will now share another clipping which was made at a much later date. This is a very much a vintage clipping and hence the pixeling and hence, hence the audio being the way it is not at its best. But at that time, we didn't know the importance of documenting. I must accept it. None of us documented our work properly. And those who documented it for us have safely put it in their lockers, like the Sangeet Nadak Academy and the NCPA, locked it up and thrown the key away into the sea. So neither we know, nor the next generation knows, what treasures there are in that treasury. The next is a much later production and has a lot of sentimental value for me because this was done as a memoriam to my husband who passed away in 2007 and he had tuned uh, the first song of the Gitanjali way back and I had always wanted to make it into a production. So using songs of Tagore in the original Bengali and using Gitanjali tuned by my husband to link it and concepts of Nerval and Swaram. So we had Ravindra, Rabindra Shangeet, we had Carnatic music, we had the body language pushed and we had literature. And this is actually I'm sharing it with you as as an example of how we push and make the literature and poetry our own. This was a production called Nirantaraha. You have tiny snippets from it, from different scenes, where, because he says, Tagore, that this body is like a pandam, a vessel, and we keep breaking it. And he keeps pouring life into it. So I took seven stages in the life of a woman and related it to this. But small little extracts put together in a little clipping for you all.
जीवन नव नव कत जे गिरि कत जे नदी तीर कत जे गिरि कत जे नदी तीर बेड़ाले बहि छोट ए बाशी तीर बेड़ाले बहि छोट ए बाशी तीर कत जे तान बजाले फिर फिर कत I've been going so far. I had to proceed further because I had I had promises to myself that I had to keep, and I used the word "dared" because whereas the symbiotic relationship between new dance, music, and literature is more easily accepted, however. In whichever direction we push it, but the dance, theatre, painting, and sculpture—the way I looked at sculpture—was another ball game altogether. And this could easily come up for criticism, but there was no point not proceeding and hesitating because one was afraid of criticism. One had to take the step, and. The test of time is what is the best examination we all face. See, those days I used to travel a lot internationally, nationally, and I went from country to country, not on touristic tours, but on performance tours. There would be fourteen concerts in fifteen days, traveling up and down through Europe. We used to travel by train, up and down, up and down, crisscrossing, but learning so much of the culture of those places, being so inspired by whatever we saw, and that really was a very learning part of my artistic journey. And one of these tours in Germany. 
I came across a contemporary piece of sculpture by Henry Moore, the great contemporary sculptor. It stopped me in my tracks. This is part of a series called The Reclining Form. It started me thinking because the strength of the human body spoke to me through these pieces of sculpture. I had always been fond of sculpture, which dancer isn't. And our Indian sculpture is so graceful, so beautiful, so evocative in its own way. But I had always been admiring the form, the bhangis, the curves, the detailing of torsos, the play of muscles, the ornamentation, the hairdos, and marveling at the grace and life that had been infused into stone and metal. Sheer beauty of it carried me away. But when I saw these uncluttered, I'm not saying that our sculpture is cluttered, but just as a phrase, unadorned piece of sculpture, awaken me to the unadorned human body. And I felt that if so much feeling and power could be could be made to emanate from stone and metal, what would not the human body be capable of? So this was the very thought that gushed through my mind when around the same time, I was awakened to the line drawings of our very own K.K. Habar by the painter himself. And this made me proceed in a in my journey with a further thrust. I felt, is it necessary that I have Vesham? Is it necessary to don the dress that the character should wear? It's not. It depends upon the artist, it depends upon the dance, it depends on the choreographer. You can use Aharya as in costume in the way you want it, but I felt could I not make the human body totally evocative in, in itself without the helps of, help of costume or vesham and without the help of props? Actually, this work had started long ago and all these were inputs along uh, the progress of time. Because in my Nritya Natikas, I had all, Natikas, I had already moved away from the Patra donning Vesham of the character. Normal costumes worn by soloists were draped in different ways. And color and weave were used to bring out the intrinsic character or quality of the theme or the character. Our Ramayanam, Raghuvam Satilakam, which Travelled to Malaysia and Singapore as early as 1985. Had all of us wearing regular costumes and dance jewelry. So I was had already started pushing the dancer's body be, towards becoming sans vesham or props, a total tool of communication. But then the next thrust went beyond delineation of human characters, all this again, in the early 90s. And through my productions, especially Sneha, Akshaydara, and Pravaha, identification of nature became a very, very important step forward. Using the body in entirety, adding to the Hasta Mukhachari formula, becoming a river, Becoming a bird, a flower, a tree, a dead snake or whatever became an unforgettable experience in itself. For we moved beyond just using the hasta, mukha and chari. Okay, and perhaps kati also. I will play a very, very vintage 
recording. It's really vintage, but just to show the process. It is from the story of G. Mutavahana, where Garuda and the Nagas had had a quarrel, and a snake had to be offered to Garuda every day. And the prince of the Nagas had to be offered to Garuda that day as a sacrifice. But Jibhutavahana, the prince, was so close to this Naga friend that he became a Naga, a snake. And you find the boneless snake in the pecking of Garuda and the flying Garuda with the snake hanging from its beak. Just to show you a sample of how we worked, we really worked on our bodies, not just at our Aramandis and Natya Ramams and Murumandis and Artha Mandiris and uh, Parshvas and Dreshras and Karinkhana and whatever, but beyond. <laughs> One of my best dancers, Anushwa Banerjee, who did Jimota Vahara. Her body would speak in any way that I pushed it. And then what happened next? I kept pushing forward. I was very much like a river flowing on, imbibing from its tributaries, never forgetting its origins and never forgetting or are being unclear of its of my goal. Even as this river flowed on, at intervals, I kept breaking the flow by building dams, building dams in the form of questioning, revisiting, contemplating, reassessing, and so on. 
And here, I would like to, I think it would be relevant to share a particularly enriching experience, which is born of the symbiotic relationship between dance, theater, and painting. I need not speak to this school about the different forms of theater. There are so many forms of theater, and there are so many forms of painting too. And I started wondering, I am turning towards theater, folk theater, contemporary theater, traditional theater, western theater, Elizabethan theater. There's so much richness everywhere. I'm look at, looking at the paintings of our very own Bengal school, Dr. Raja Ravi Verma, the Impressionist, the Old Dutch School of Painting. There's so many. This is such a rich treasure, treasure trove. And where in this treasure trove can I seek inspiration? By opening it, it should not become a Pandora's box with all the insects flying out. I had to be, I had to look at Aujityam. I had to look at the spirit. I had to look at dance as a total school tool of communication using the entire body, which was relevant to this day's scenario, today's social context, today's cultural context and times. And here I would like to share with you a project which resulted, which had a very positive end result. You know, in the late 80s and the early 90s, Words like uh, collaboration and words like terms like interdisciplinary activity did not exist, exist. But it was happening all the time. And we find that amongst the greats, those who inspired us and continue to inspire us are the ones who were always open and inclusive. So the year was 1996. And I was working on what today you would call a collaborative project. And the project that I worked on was with Namuthu Swami, who headed Kutupatare, who brought and gave, who gave, I would say, who, uh, who gave a totally new dimension to Terukutu, the street theater of Tamil Nadu. You know, in this immersive experience, nowadays the word immersion is used a lot, but I have always said we have to be like Urai or pickles, and we must soak ourselves in the oil and the chili powder and the salt and the turmeric, and then only rasa is born. We have to, we have to be like pickles, and today we use the word immersive. So, in this very beautiful, immersive experience, I was inspired by the Kutik tradition. And first here, I should say, what was the end, culmination of this project? It was our mega production, Panchali. So, I worked towards creating a body language for the Kauravas, which was distinctive from the body language of the comparatively better part of us. I just say comparatively better. You know, I was, the, the floor movements, the early movements of Pramukuta were reflective of the character of the Kauravas. So I used low flung movements, slow creeping movements which suggested their evilness, their very negative qualities. And in contrast, I worked on a more upright body stance for the Pandavas. And to enhance this, I used lighting. The lighting of the Kauravas was dark red. It was floor lighting. It's nothing new today. It's happening all the time. But I'm talking about the history. It's not history. It's the context that time when it was done. Red floor lighting for the Kauravas and 
lighting from the Mahas of the Pandavas. This happened because I was working on formulating a body language inspired by Therukuta. And Kutupatri was working on adapting mood lighting of the theater for dance. Because if you, if you just adopt mood lighting of theater, it doesn't work. You need to adapt it to dance. And that is what they were working at. Now here I need to go back two years to share the progression of my work. I had earlier during the Urahat Tamil Mahanada or the World Tamil Conference at Tanjavu in 1994, presented Panchali for the first time as a group. And uh, in this production, it began with a very beautiful Anjali and then the body of the work and Panchali's oath at the end. It was only in 1996 that I reassessed my work again, two years later. When I looked at it, I was thinking, if I wrote an essay, there should be an introduction, there should be a body, there should be a conclusion. Then what does my beautiful Anjali have to do with the body of the conflict which is coming later? I had eight pretty girls doing pretty, pretty movements with pretty, pretty adavas, with pretty, pretty formations. But where was it reflecting? As an introduction, the mood of the body of, which, of the production which was to follow. Because Panchali is all about conflict. It is about attack and defense. It is Dharma Kshetre Guru Kshetre. It, is, it also symbolizes the internal conflict. Then, so should not I re-look really at the Anjali? And it was at this time that Yudhanjali was born. I remember waking my husband up at two at two at night and saying, come on, wake up and let's work on the music for a piece. It has to be all Veera and, uh, and it, should, it should echo the battlefield. And the, I worked with the dancers' bodies using our regular Bharatanatyam adavas, but giving them the spirit of attack and defense. So the attack and defense and conflict was established in the Yudhanjali. This was a thrust in the way I different thrust in a different direction at the way I looked at a production. After that, we came to the body, and after that ended with the, uh, the, the with the with the production itself. And here, the Kauravas, as I said earlier, used these low flung body movements, which really suggested evil. And I talked about the amber lighting from the, from FOH coming, filtering down, not a direct light, but filtering down. And you know what my source of inspiration for that light, light filtering through? It was the Impressionist school of painting. Because the old school of Dutch painting had dark and dun, dull colors on the canvas. The Impressionists stripped the dark paints and brought in sunlight into the canvas. It was so inspiring. And I, inspired by Renoir, by Cezanne, by Monet, I brought in these light from the bars above. And as a result, the game of dice was and still is a scene that many people in the dance world speak about. I have come to the end and will just play two clippings for you. One from a solo where all the aspects I have spoken about, dance, music, literature, Painting, sculpture, lighting comes together in making dance a symbiotic tool of communication. The music, 
the lyrics are from Devaram. That is itself is extension of Nirvana. We have the Ardhanarishvara Tattva brought out, in which the body speaks in itself. A small clipping from Unnamale, which is a Devaram written by, I wouldn't say written by, but received by the boy Saint Tiranyana Sambhata. Ulla bulai ubaya lodum budaagiye oruvan pinnaagiye pirumanale tiruma bani tigare mandar thara arvi. Or 
Finally, the game of dice from Bajani. I would like to say, in conclusion, that this has not been something, it is not a journey that became, began yesterday or a few years ago and concluded at a point of time. It is a journey that began somewhere in the late 30s. It has been a dis journey of discovery and it continues till today through search, through research, through ups and downs, through trials and errors, through successes and failures, but always keeping the peak in mind, always keeping the eye on the peak. I have many promises to keep. Until the day I leave this physical form, my art will always be a work in progress. I will always be a student of our great art forms, seeking the ultimate spiritual symbiosis, 
through this very beautiful art form, having developed what Carlyle would say, the seeing eye and the hearing ear, I encourage every one of you youngsters to do the same, because then there is no limit to the ananda, the bliss that one experiences in this journey. I have miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you very much for inviting me to share my thoughts, making me really look at my work and giving me such a wonderful audience of students, colleagues from the fraternity, respected Vice-Chancellor and Dean. Thank you, Anuradha, at the Department of Dance from Brindic Media. I would like to acknowledge my young student, Sai Priya, who handled the part of the presentation which I'm totally ignorant about. And I would also like to acknowledge here Sukanya Ravinder, our deputy director, who created the PowerPoint and worked at it with sincerity and dedication. Thank you. Madam, this was an overwhelming reach out. I almost felt that I am looking at a Claude Monet impressionistic painting where everything is fuzzy but everything is clear. Everything is abstract but everything is far reaching. So your journey was very, very inspirational, is inspirational, will be inspirational. You touched upon two or three very, very fundamental issues, namely the issue of continuum, various art forms are a run of continuum in the sphere of expressionism. One touches the other and the other takes over and then mingles with the next, next. So there was a continuum and there was symbiosis. One cannot exist without the other. These are two fundamental tenets based on which education must reside. And this I think is a very very important take home for not only the teachers but also the students. I must also observe that you were upbringing in London where you did ballet. I think did lot of inner awakening in you which made you much more analytical than most contemporary artists of your type are. That western upbringing actually brought out the urge to synthesize and I can see that and we are all blessed to be hearing you. Your Tevaram was completely mesmerizing. And your Rabindra Sangeet rendered the way you rendered was totally mind boggling.
so the woods are lovely dark and deep i'm sure you will continue and i'm sure you'll get inspired and i hope the students took very important messages that madam was conveying in her in her lecture demonstration that one must not only perform but analyze it one must not only analyze but question it one must not one must not only question it but get, get insights i think that deeper journey is what came out in your uh, lecture demonstration and this is what my students must take home and begin their own journeys in the way they want to so this has been a blessing here to be with you on this podium and uh, i'm i'm remembering nataraja ramkrishna ji for bringing all these all these all these forces all these powers onto the stage where us and the students all of us will get benefited and enrich our lives namaste thank you very much i now request uh, the vice chancellor professor b j rao to hand over a momento to the guest speaker today on behalf of uh, nataraj ramakrishna and hanachyam trust shri kala krishna would like to honor her. good evening everybody uh, thank you very much for being present at the distinguished lecture here today uh, first of all i'd like to thank uh, shrimati chitra visveshwaran for her illustrative talk and also reminding us that art is something that one needs to keep exploring and experimenting with all the time thank you very much for the reminder madam thank you so much uh i also like to thank professor bj rao our vice chancellor for taking the time out i know how many people must have lined up at his office today but he always takes time out for such events thank you very much for coming sir uh i also thank professor anuradha and the dance department for inviting uh shrimati chitra visveshwaran uh to university of hyderabad to deliver this lecture because without which we would not have been witness to such a wonderful lecture thank you so much once again uh and thank you all for for being such a wonderful audience uh i'd also like to thank the dean of uh school of humanities for 
giving us this auditorium uh, the teaching and non teaching staff here who have helped us with with all the logistics and arrangements the students of uh, the dance department uh, the teachers and each one of you who are here and outside who have contributed to making this event a success thank you so much once again I don't know if he is around, but I also thank the PRO for coordinating with the Vice Chancellor's office to make this event happen. <laughs>